brother and sister are driving through the Florida back roads on their way home for spring break. A chance encounter with a road rage truck driver puts them in the crosshairs of a vicious monster who wants to assimilate their organs. A monster movie written and directed by an actual monster. This is 2001's Jeepers Creepers. I'm Connor as Gary, and this is Filmgasm. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Filmgasm podcast. Today, I'd like to introduce a new guest host to the team, a fellow historian and colleague of mine, Christian Aguilar. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Connor. It's a pleasure to be here. I know we've been talking about this for a while. Um, Great to finally get it done and kind of join the little team you got going here. I know how much work you put into this, so I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm excited. I'm always on the lookout for people who share my interests and want to, you know, have something to say here. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself and tell the audience a bit about why you like horror movies so much. Sure. So my name is Christian Aguilar. Um, horror movies and just movies in general have always been a special place in my in my heart. And just like earliest memories, I've always been watching movies. Um, some of the first movies I ever remember watching um, at home were Porky's, um, the raunchy classic. Um, and I have no idea why my mom showed that to me at such a young age. Uh, my mom is a really devout Catholic, and I have no idea how Porky's came into uh, the picture, but that is one of the earliest movies I remember watching. Um, along with that is the Hitchcock's Birds, and so that's really, uh, <laughs> really drove a, a nail in the in the coffin to the say and made me love horror. And uh, she, uh, yeah, she's definitely grew up around the '80s, and she was a she was 20 years old in the 80s, so she was definitely the demographic for a lot of the slasher movies, and, um, you know, she shared that sort of same love with me, um, so I grew up watching Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Sleepaway Camp, like all the classic Halloween, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then being a 2000s kid, being, uh, you know, exposed to some of the reboots and then some of the originals, of course, of like the era, you know, as YG Creepers, especially, especially has like a, a place in my heart. Uh, as one of the first scary movies I remember uh, watching, being afraid of, and just enjoying, uh, and enjoying consistently throughout the years. Uh, it's definitely uh, been a staple horror movie uh, that I love to watch uh, over and over again, personally. <laughs> yeah, you're going to fit in just fine around here. Um, the Porky's thing reminds me of something my, my parents did. I think that, you know, if, if you haven't seen a film in like 20 years, there's a disconnect. You're like, oh, it pro- I, probably not as bad as I remember it. Because when I was like seven or eight, my parents showed me The Thing. And uh, they were like, oh, it's 1982. It's probably going to be kind of goofy now. And I watched 90% of that movie through my mom's hand. Uh, and that was worse because I was just imagining crazy shit to go with these like noises I was hearing. <laughs> so, yeah, that happens. I, I get why, you know, you think Porky's probably isn't that bad. But I, I haven't seen Porky's personally, but I've heard it's a... Uh, it's quite a raunchy movie. Yeah, uh, I love how much you said about the watching it through your, you know, your parents' hands because that was definitely a staple. Uh, and then had um, two older brothers with about like an eight, eight, eight uh, year age difference, and so yeah, when they were interested in all the cool, gruesome things, and I was still young, um, but wanted to be involved, and forced myself, and so watching stuff behind the pillow and generally being afraid. And then having older brothers to torment you um, with stories that, hey, you know, Freddie, Jason and Michael Myers are all outside of our small (laughs) uh, two bedroom apartment and they're waiting to kill you. So that's always a great uh, memory of mine. That's cool. I was um, I don't have any siblings, but I'm the oldest of uh, six cousins. And so I was kind of the, the ringleader, so to speak. And none of them really got into film as much as I did, which is kind of a bummer. So it's been kind of just me until I started this thing. And now I've got a team of people who love movies that I'm constantly talking about movies with. Uh, (laughs) So before we get into it, um, I've got two updates on the rewind. First, an update on episode 73, Training Day. A prequel to Training Day is in development at Warner Brothers, currently titled Training Day, Day of the Riot. The film's going to follow a young Alonzo Harris during the 1992 LA riots. 
There's a rumor that original film star Denzel Washington's son, John David Washington, is being considered to play young Alonzo, which is pretty cool. Probably won't happen. I feel like he doesn't want to play his dad's roles, I, I bet. And I don't really think we need more Training Day. Training Day is such a tight, compact, perfect movie that I just feel like we don't need more. I just hope whoever does get cast uh, does a callback to the King Kong and got shit on me because that is one of my favorite quotes um, of movie history in general. Um, so that seems, it seems a little bit like a cash grab. seems like a little bit like a Men in Black 4 type of, uh, type of beat. Uh, but I guess we'll see, especially, yeah, his son is such a great actor. So yeah, if he is involved in any, you know, any sort of form, I'm sure it'll be something worth watching even for nostalgia purposes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be something. Uh, I don't, it might not even happen. So many movies get announced prematurely. Like I know recently. They just announced uh, Star Trek Four is in development, and apparently the entire cast is coming back, and uh, they didn't know that. Like, nobody told them. So I feel like they're jumping the gun here, but, you know, maybe it'll happen. Maybe we'll get to see this. Uh, we'll see. Uh, next, an update on episode 74, Alien. Um, a new Alien film is in development from Evil Dead remake director Fede Alvarez. Uh, Ridley Scott is producing. Um, Disney, now that they have... Uh, ownership over the alien franchise is going hard uh, with a new series in development at Hulu. And then this film, which will also be on Hulu. So I I'm on board. Fede Alvarez killed it with evil dead. He did a great job producing the Texas chainsaw movie from a couple weeks ago. So this guy clearly knows how to reboot horror. So maybe he's the guy we need to get alien back on track. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I'm very excited I think that we're having a wave of kind of the prequel, know, the prequel sort of sequel reboot wave. And so it's a very exciting time for movies in this genre, I think. Um, and then we have such like this Gen Z, the way that they're being exposed to these things, you know, um, they're a little bit cut off from the, sort of the, the source material. And so being able to bring that to a new generation. Yeah, definitely exciting. Uh, and yeah, the new social media real world implications is also, you know, because who doesn't love Leatherface killing uh, hipsters? I love that. So I'm excited to see wherever uh, these kind of reboots go. Yeah, me too. Apparently the, the series is going to take place on Earth, which is the first time outside of the Alien versus Predator movies, which we don't really count, that the <laughs> aliens are coming to Earth. So I'm excited to see that. I know Noah Hawley's producing it. He did a fantastic job with the Fargo show. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where all this goes. I hope they have a vision and it's not just, you know, making it up as they go along, which seems like they've been doing with this franchise. I'm also a little worried that Ridley Scott might overplay his producing hand and call a lot more shots, maybe take some of the creative cre control away from Fede Alvarez. I hope that doesn't happen. Cross our finger. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that is all for the rewind. Now into Jeepers Creepers. So to start... Uh, the song Jeepers Creepers was written by Harry Warren and Johnny Mercer for the 1938 film Going Places. It was sung by Louis Armstrong, who sang it to a horse because in the 1930s, black actors were not filmed singing to each other. I don't know why. I don't know why that was just yet another thing they wouldn't let African Americans do in the 30s. Seems so unnecessary, but you know, I'm not a racist, so I can't wrap my head around this. Um, the song was nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars, but lost to Thanks for the Memory from the film The Big Broadcast of 1938. It's since become a jazz standard, has been covered by countless artists over the decades. And I had no idea this song came from a movie, that it's an Oscar-nominated song. That was just hilarious, because it's it's kind of a shitty song. <laughs> yeah, if you told me, like, any prior knowledge that this was just an, a song made for specifically Jeepers Creepers, I would believe you. Uh, and I think I would say a majority of the people who know this song know it from this movie. And yeah. so I would totally believe you. This was, yeah, this is created uh, specifically for a horror movie. Uh, because, yeah, it's not, I don't know, maybe there's a time, time skip and I just don't get it. Uh, not my type of vibe, personally. This was the uptown funk of 1938. Like, this was <laughs> huge, I bet. People were wagging their fingers and dancing to this for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I think the lyrics in the context of uh, this horror movie have never allowed me to 
Um, yeah, not imagine a giant fat gargoyle um, <laughs> going to get me. So, One of the things I do love about this movie is how little it tells us about the creeper. It's just this demon bat thing that's eating people and no one seems to know where it came from or why it's doing this. They just stay out of its way. I like that. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the best things about this movie is like there's so much luster, sort of allure towards this new sort of thing, especially the first half of the movie, which, you know, the first half of this movie from what I've seen in reviews and other people's opinion is like, yeah, the first half is the best half of the movie, uh, you know, such a strong start. And the second half is where it becomes more criticized. Um, but once you turn from that sort of, you know, oh, this is just a guy in a truck and he's driving around and then you know, 15 minutes later, oh, you're dealing with a, you know, a real monster gargoyle thing. Uh, and so there's a human aspect to it. And then there's this sort of demonic alien. You don't know what's going on. Um, and by the end of the movie, you're just left like, what the fuck is going on? This is, <laughs> this is awesome. This huge new movie monster to fall in love with. Uh, <laughs> so I definitely agree. Yeah, there's so much space for a, a world building and, you know, future movies. I think, uh, Maybe that's success. They knew what they had uh, when they made the movie. So, of course, leave it open for sequels of the sort. Yeah, for sure. So let's get this out of the way. Uh, you're talking about Jeepers Creepers, you, you got to talk about Victor Salva. Uh, so the film was written and directed by Victor Salva, who is a highly controversial figure in the film community. In 1988, Salva was convicted of sexual misconduct with a 12-year-old uh, who was the, one of the stars of his debut film, Clown House. Child pornography was also found in his home. He pled guilty to lewd conduct, oral sex with a minor, and possession of child pornography. He was sentenced to three years in state prison. He served only 15 months and completed his parole in 1992. He went on to make Jeepers Creepers 1, 2, and 3, as well as The Nature of the Beast, Powder, Rites of Passage, and Peaceful Warrior. He since had the Jeepers Creepers franchise taken away from him with a fourth film due to release later this year without his involvement. And a lot of people have con condemned this movie, put the cast it aside because they want nothing to do with this piece of shit. Um, and it's just, I don't know where I really stand on that because we've done like episodes, you know, we've done Roman Polanski films, we've done Kevin Spacey films. And I try to separate the work from the people who made it because the film Jeepers Creepers did nothing wrong. It had not, it didn't do anything to children. It's not a harmful film. It's just a movie. But this guy's a fucking monster, and I can't believe he only served 15 months for raping a child. No, I definitely agree with you. Um, I don't think, I think I learned that about like the, about Victor Salva, you know, wasn't, wasn't until I, I was an adult, you know, of course, as a youth, you know, you're watching this movie, uh, you don't really, yeah, you don't really go into like who's behind the, you know, behind the camera or anything like that. Uh, and to learn like, that it was like his, uh, you know, these, I mean, these are not, they're not allegations, what he actually did do, you know, um, which is a big difference, you know, it's not canceled. This is something way different before cancel culture. Uh, one of those things like he is a convicted um, child molester. And so that is like something so serious. Um, but when watching this movie, you know, you don't, I like, I didn't have that context at first. And so I was like, I had that totally disassociated. So when I learned it later as an adult, I was like, yeah, like this is so disgusting that this person was able to get away with it. Um, yeah, basically essentially get away with it. Like 15 months of a three-year sentence um, for actually molesting a child and having child pornography. I mean, as like a parent now, like, yeah, no way, definitely condemn any sort of, uh, yeah, acts with the children. It's like disgusting and he's a disgusting, he is a monster. Um, but I do think uh, being able to appreciate the work and I was having a discussion with someone earlier about this, uh, but being able to kind of appreciate the entirety, you know, it's not just one person behind a movie, you know, yeah. he's the writer director, but, you know, I think it would be a huge discredit to the team. Uh, Jonathan Breck, the, you know, he's like such a, yeah, the performance he gives in his role, Justin Long, like, I think Gina Phillips, like super underrated, like they're, yeah, this is a really good, movie that's brought to a bunch of people not just uh, you know victor salva so i think um them removing him from the franchise is definitely a step in the right direction um of course you have to admit you know like he is the the visionary behind this 
Um, but things can exist without, without you know, their creators. And I think that um, it's a step in the right direction, uh, definitely. Um, but it does give a scarier feel knowing that, yeah, a monster created a monster, this, this scary, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, terrifying, you know, so um, that is, of course, a factor. And now watching it is kind of like a, a deeper sort of nuance into uh, why Jeepers Creepers is so scary, I would say. Yeah, this definitely adds to it. Uh, it's, um, I get why people don't want to watch this. You know, I, I, I understand if you want to just not deal with that, if you won't, don't want to have to, uh, yeah, I get that. It's, 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 it's gross. It's grisly. And it, it makes you think about it. And I, I'm blown away that these crimes don't carry much harsher sentences. That, that, that blows my mind that you can do something like that and serve, get a three-year sentence. And while somebody else can get arrested for like, you know, possession of weed and go to jail for the rest of their life. Like we got to re we got to think that shit through, <laughs> Put the root, you know, the monster should be in prison. Like, ah, it, it just bothers me. I know I'm not going to, obviously I'm not going to solve that here, <laughs> but um, I just, you know, I like to make it clear where I stand and Jeepers Creepers, the film is fine. You can like the film. You don't have to like this, this piece of shit. You don't have to, we don't. Greatly said, I couldn't say better myself. Uh, yeah. Fuck Victor Sala. Well, Jeepers Creepers, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree that, uh, yeah, moving forward, it's definitely in the right step without him. And yeah, um, you hear stuff about like these child molesters and these people like, oh, you're dead as soon as you get convicted with, you know, you're a chomo and all this stuff happens to you in prison. It's not necessarily the case. You know, these people are priests, counselors, interact with children still. Um, it's terrible. So, you know, definitely, uh, yeah. Definitely something to, for a different podcast for sure, but uh, an important topic and not where, do not support Victor Salva at all. Um, but I love this movie. So that's definitely one of the more contentious reasons why I wanted to choose it. Um, yeah, we can appreciate these things and look forward and appreciate uh, different aspects of the past. Yeah, exactly. What we tend to do here on Filmgasm is we find weird films, we talk about the development and we uncover, you know, why certain films have lasted so long. And Victor Salva is not the reason we're still talking about Jeepers Creepers 20 years later. It's because it's a creepy horror film that's well done, well acted, and started a franchise that people love. So, you know, I, I think that's important. Uh, so, now that we got that out of the way, let's go, let's talk about the pod. It's all positive from here on out. Uh, the idea for Jeepers Creepers came partly from the police manhunt of Dennis Depew in 1990. DePew had been caught dumping the body of his wife behind an abandoned schoolhouse in Michigan by brother and sister Ray and Marie Thornton. Just like the movie, they just happened to be driving past this church and saw this dude dumping a body. Or it was a schoolhouse in real life. Uh, he allegedly chased the pair down in his truck before they got away, and DePew committed suicide the day after, uh, after a shootout with the cops. Uh, the case was featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries in 1991. Uh, Salva also says he was inspired by the films Night of the Living Dead and Duel as well. And he's neither confirmed nor denied the inspiration from the Unsolved Mysteries thing. But the, f the similarities are too crazy to ignore. Like, just, uh, just own it. But uh, that's fucking crazy that these, these two people were just driving in the countryside. They see some psycho dumping a body. He sees them and then he just takes off after them. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, I think uh, uh, to me, you know, we're in Texas, so... Um, you know, Texas is driving. And so especially where I'm from, I'm from like the border. And so, you know, road trips is something I grew up on and you, I drive through the King Ranch and it's two lanes and there's no cell phone service. And so watching this as a kid and we would travel to San Antonio and it's like four hour drive and, you know, we're passing down like these ranches and there's nothing here. And then there's a car stopped across, you know, um, it's genuinely scary. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I've, like when I learned that it wasn't actually confirmed that he took this, like he hasn't accepted that this is actual inspiration. Uh, but I have heard that story about the Depew uh, family. And so, yeah, I don't know why you wouldn't just go outright admit it. Like it's way too similar um, and you don't lose any sort of credit. Like it's nothing like, yeah, I mean, still a, like a relatively original thought. Um, but yeah, the real life horror aspect of, uh, yeah, you're just going to drive down the road one day and you're going to see an act of, of murder. Uh, yeah, because why not? America. I had to stop watching Unsolved Mysteries because it was making me insanely paranoid. <laughs> it was just too, uh, 
I kept thinking about how many murders go unsolved and how many people just disappear. And it was fucking with my head. So I stopped watching it. <laughs> yeah, I can do horror movies. You know, I can do almost any genre of horror. Uh, I cannot do real true crime. That shit scares me. Like, uh, I watched the Night Stalker, like the Richard Ramirez or Son of Sam, like on Netflix, all those documentaries. And yeah, that fucks me up way more than any sort of horror movie ever will. Um, because yeah, real people are so much scarier than a fucking bad demon personally, because I know real people are capable of some sick shit. Um, and so, yeah, no, I definitely agree. I'm on that same boat. Um, but yeah, such a, such a chilling sense, you know, that one day you're going to be driving down the road, uh, and then you'll just, yeah, why not? Just someone throwing, uh, their dead wife in a, in a, in, is a schoolhouse, right? And, yeah, it was, it was behind a, a schoolhouse. I, I think it was some pipe or like a, a, a hole or something. Yeah, that's that's insane. And I think, was it during the day as well? Yeah, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to be for sure. Uh, keep an eye out uh, my next road trip. Um, I maybe turn a blind eye, honestly, because yeah, I'm not going to go down uh, that sort of rabbit hole. <laughs> Try your best to get the plate and just get the fuck out of there. Yeah, beating you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's go into the cast. Uh, Justin Long plays Derry. Long has uh, also been in Dodgeball, Galaxy Quest, Accepted, Live Free or Die Hard, Idiocracy, and the Netflix series F is for Family as the voice of rebellious teenager Kevin Murphy. And uh, I love him in F is for Family. He's such a dope. Uh, yeah, I think he's a good, you know, he, he needs to, like, I like him in this because he's got to be relatable and he's just, you know, 20-something-year-old teenager bringing laundry home for, for mom who just stumbles into this crazy-ass situation. Uh, yeah, perfect. he's definitely a good, uh, annoying little brother, I will say. Um, but then you kind of see, like, he does become sort of brave and, uh, you know, like a generally good guy, you know, he has good intentions. Uh, I think Justin Long is a underrated actor, and that's because I, one of the other things to give kind of context to that, I grew up very much watching, like, old school, the whole frat pack, Apatow, a lot of those kind of raunchy movies, and so, uh, yeah, Justin Long kind of you know, rode that little wave a little bit. Um, accepted. I've seen way too many times. Dodgeball is one of my favorite movies, personally. Um, yeah, I think he's great in this, and he definitely has uh, range in a different way, in a way you don't, you know, really associate him, especially him being so young in this. Um, yeah, he does a good job as in this sort of role of the annoying teen. It fits his soul vibe during this time. Yeah, this was his first uh, leading role. He was 22 years old. Um, yeah, Dodgeball is a classic. I love Dodgeball. Um, I love him in Galaxy Quest as the nerd who is like obsessed with this Star Trek like show, who immediately like believes it's real and knows all the technical shit to help them escape. Was, that was great. His brief role in Idiocracy might be my favorite though. Um, have you seen Idiocracy? Yes. Uh, I guess I don't remember what Justin or who Justin Long plays. I do. Yeah, I do like Idiocracy. Um, it's I didn't know it was filmed in San Marcos. Uh, Starplex makes the cameo in the back. That's like that's awesome. Uh, who does he play in Idiocracy? When Luke Wilson first wakes up in the future, he goes to the hospital, and Justin Long is his doctor. <laughs> I remember now. Yeah, okay, I definitely remember now. Yeah. Doctor Lexus is like it says here <laughs> on your chart that you're fucked up. <laughs> Oh, yeah, look, looking through his filmography, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, Zach and Miri make a porno, uh, <laughs> where he plays Brandon St. Randy as the, yeah, as the gay porn star of uh, Miri Miri's like high school crush, and I, I love that. Um, yeah, Zach and Miri has one of my favorite interactions of dialogue ever. It's when Seth Rogen and Craig Robinson are talking at the coffee shop. And Craig's working behind the counter, and this guy's like, "Hey, can I get a cup of coffee, black?" And he's like, "Can't you see we're talking white?" I love that clip so much, and so I'm glad that we're on the same boat because, yeah, uh, <laughs> that is one. I love Craig Robinson. I yeah, I love that movie. So good. That's a good good match right now because I love that clip so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, Gina Phillips plays Trish. She reprised her role in Jeepers Creepers three. But apart from that, she's mostly done bit parts for various 90s shows. She never really did anything of note 
after Jeepers Creepers, which happens, you know. Uh, and that's just of note to me. You know, some people might be super fans of these random TV shows that I've never heard of. Uh, but she's good in this. Uh, a little uh, annoying at times, like when she's just screaming down the tube, like, like you know, say something. You're freaking me out. Like, yeah, it's a tense situation. Everybody's freaked out. You don't need to say that. <laughs> yeah, I love that, like, in this movie, they're very self-aware in the sense of, like, she's like, oh, this is exactly, like, there's a bit where it's like, oh, this is, like, what the, they say in the horror movie before something stupid happens. Or, and I'm like, I love that because, yeah, she's not just, like, the boobs out, final girl, uh, dumb, you know. Um, they try to put a little bit of nuance, like, oh, she's sad from a heartbreak, so that's why they're taking the, the long way home. And, you know, she's an emotional... Uh, 20 something year old in college and she's going through a heartbreak and so dealing with her annoying brother um yeah moody 2000s angst you know um i think she's very yeah very likable um yeah there's a little bit more depth than just yeah hot girl on screen uh running away from scary monster <laughs> well it's implied that uh her poli sci boyfriend is uh, abusing her because there's that scene where he's, you know, Justin Long has the beating you recollection. And he, he says, like, what did Mr. Polly Sci Guy do to you anyway? And then he says beating you. And she kind of looks at him in a way to say, like, how did you know? But that's never explored because then the crazy dude shows up and that's a, that becomes the focus of the movie. But, you know, if you catch an out of that nuance, it's there. Definitely. <laughs> um, Jonathan Breck plays the creeper. He would reprise the role in Jeepers Creepers 2 and 3, was also in Everybody Wants Some, Spy Kids 4, and Parkland. Uh, yeah, Spy Kids 4. <laughs> and he's creepy as hell. Um, just his, the way he holds himself, the way he like sniffs around, like he's, he's barely human. It's yeah. Creepy um, one of my favorite, one, I'm a huge fan of practical effects. So I grew up watching Lord of the Rings. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Um, the OG Star Wars trilogy. I'm like a sucker for practical effects. Um, I think it would be a true disservice if you did not appreciate this movie uh, just solely for its director because the practical effects team and just like the work that they put in this movie that uh, the makeup, everything's like that totally, you know, it's still as good as when you watched it the first time, I would say. Um, he is generally creepy and just like the 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 body acting and being able to do that without any real dialogue which i didn't know that they were going to give him the, like actual speaking parts um but yeah i think that's that's crazy that he uh there's this one scene where it's like after he gets run over and he's like limping that is like so chilling and he's like crawled limping to behind the police station um yeah he definitely kills it in this um freak as hell still scares me to this day I love seeing him in bits where he's not as playing, you know, the character and he's just in the makeup. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely a iconic uh, character, iconic Orville. Yeah, I've, through, the, through the course of this show, I've, I've come to appreciate uh, these actors who can play these silent monsters like, you know, Kane Hodder as Jason, Nick Castle as Michael Myers. Like they don't have dialogue, but you need a solid actor in that mask to convey menace without dialogue. And he 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 accomplishes as big time as the creeper. Um, Patricia Belcher plays uh, Giselle, the psychic. She was also in Flatliners, Species, Five Hundred Days of Summer, Cajillionaire, Lawnmower Man Two, Beyond Cyberspace, and Fifty Five Episodes of Bones as Caroline Julian. Lawnmower Man, have not seen that yet. I've heard it's absolute horseshit, but I'll get there. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely added to the list and we can see where it goes. <laughs> I She's kind of the one bit of this film I feel like I don't need is a psychic. <laughs> yeah, that's like where the second see the second half of the movie criticism, um, because yeah, it just doesn't fit. You know, it's just like this weird um these people are connected and if, if they would have explored it maybe more in like future films of hey maybe there's like a group of people that have this historical connection to the creeper and they're able to do this uh no she's just a crazy medium that the police know of she's a staple in the community as the crazy lady um and then the random call you know when they're at the diner and he's telling she's telling 
uh, dairy, everything that, you know, is going on and they're looking for her, you know, and then she just pops up at the end. It's like, Hey, here I am, <laughs> um, you know, psychic powers. It just, I mean, if you're going to have a crazy bad monster, it fits, but you know, you definitely need to explore that more uh, or give some of, yeah. Besides just, Hey, I'm Giselle. And I'm uh, it's like, yeah, it's funny you should mention the lack of exploration because apparently for this upcoming fourth movie, that's what they're doing. They're going into the psychic connection of the this, like people who have a psychic connection to the creeper. They're going into that. Uh, we'll talk more about that towards the end. Uh, finally, Oscar nominee Eileen Brennan plays the cat lady. Uh, Brennan was nominated for her performance in 1980s Private Benjamin, was also in Clue, Murder by Death, Miss Congeniality 2, and a lot of TV. Uh, she died in 2013 at 80 years old from bladder cancer. And she plays um, Mrs. Peacock in Clue, and I adore her in that. So I was blown away when I'm like, that's Eileen Brennan. <laughs> so that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I did not know when I was looking up the cast, I did not know that she was such a, like such a, you know, like a timeless actress, you know, and uh, yeah, learning that, uh, learning that later on, I was like, well, I appreciate her role in this. Yeah, it's, it's such an odd, sudden thing for him them to just stumble upon this crazy cat lady who claims she doesn't have a phone and then says she does have a phone and then like super pissed that the creeper's going after her cats. Like it's such an odd scene, but yeah. And then she goes over like the yeah, she goes over the the zoning, the zoning laws in the county, like, oh well, we're we're in this county now, so you're gonna have to call them, but don't don't give them that my address because they're gonna get me for my cats. Like yeah, it's like way too like, oh, what is this normal person doing in this film? Um, worried about zoning uh, so they don't take away all her cats i love that i love that the creeper just like take like replaces her scarecrow briefly because and i like the explanation later of like well he's got to get as much fear out of these kids as possible or else the meat's not going to taste as good or whatever it was like yeah that would freak me out if all of a sudden the scarecrow can move yeah, the creeper is definitely a favorite of mine specifically for that reason. In the whole, you know, he wants you to feel hopeless, hopeless, you know. I think the best horror villains uh, give you that sense of hopelessness. Um, for me, top, you know, three or top two is always, uh, you know, Freddy Krueger because, you know, everyone has to go to sleep, um, you know. And so there's that energy of like hopelessness, of like feeding off of your fear intentionally scary not just like oh i'm gonna murder you um, but i also want you to be shitting your pants while i do it um, because you're gonna taste better in my yeah my my bad mouth <laughs> i remember as a kid i stumbled upon this on tv once right during the scene where the creeper like bit the bit the tongue out of the head and being like what is ah, and turning the channel and then years later, I watched the movie again, and I'm like, wait a minute, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, and then he whistles in this, which I thought was like, yeah, why not? He's a really good whistler um, for being like a demonic thousand-year-old beast. Uh, yeah, that he's like intentionally whistling the song. And the fact that he has a song, like your best horror villain has a theme song, like that is so <laughs> cool uh, that the, if you hear the song, you're screwed, like. You know, this guy is a jazz connoisseur, specifically pick, like I wonder if he picked it out, you know, or what the 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 in-world storytelling is behind that. Um, but I love that. Like, yeah, I'm gonna whistle and I'm gonna scare, scare scare the shit out of you, you know. Considering he's like ageless, I don't think it's crazy to think he wrote that song. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens in this next movie. Maybe they'll we'll explore that. Yeah, he grabbed, he kidnapped some some singers, forced them to record that, and then took the the master track with him. Yeah, um, Louis Armstrong as him. Uh, that's his IP for sure. <laughs> oh, Jeepers Creepers has an IMDb score of six point two, Rotten Tomatoes score of forty six percent. Yeah, horror. You know, Rotten Tomatoes is never kind of horror unless it's some A twenty four drama bullshit. Uh, <laughs> It was a decent hit, grossing $59 million on a budget of only $10 million, spawned three sequels, and is considered a cult favorite franchise at this point. Uh, so with that, let's discuss some highlights of the film. Um, first up, I love the, the fact that 
this crazy flying bat gargoyle demonic creature drives a truck. That just makes me yeah. happy. Not a tr- not just a truck. And then Justin Long says like, "Oh, this guy is souped up. Like <laughs> he like modded that. He tricked it out. Like it is a slab. Like it is. Yeah, he's whipping it on the highway. Like he is really out of his way to kill these people. But the fact that he has wings and chooses to drive a souped up truck to run you off the road, like he's an asshole on purpose. Uh, he could just lift you up out of the air. But now he's in. A, and then the that nuance of the. This guy picked out a. You telling me this guy has a vanity plate? Like a monster has a vanity plate? Like he did not wait at the DMV. Like he got beating you and yeah, put it on there. Yeah. Intentionally, you know. So uh, he's definitely one of the more funny. If you like take a like, if you put all the pieces together, the creeper is hilarious. He's an asshole. Uh, he'll go out of your way not to kill you, but uh, he'll make it funny. So I love that. <laughs> it's like if Freddie had a plate that said like Razor Claw One. Or some crazy shit. It's just like he had to order that. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny that the creeper is just so. I mean, he's he's clearly got nitrous in that in that engine. Like that thing is hardcore, and you can tell he's been driving it for like fifty years. <laughs> yeah, we need the uh, Fast and Furious. The creeper joins the family uh, at the end with the beating you car. Because uh, why not? You know. Yeah, at this point, I mean, what else can they do besides just turn it into a fucking horror movie? Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, this film kind of starts out just, you know, road trip. They're in a, a 60s uh, Chevrolet for some reason. I don't know why they have a 60s Impala, but, you know, whatever. And they're just talking about the fact that it's weird that she's driving across Florida with her brother instead of doing something fun for spring break. And I think it's also crazy that we ended up doing this right before our spring break. <laughs> yeah. I'm supposed to travel home and like go through a road trip. So uh, this is not a good time for me to watch this. Um, but yeah, like the fact that anyone would choose, I try to have to drive four hours straight to go home, but I think they said like, it's a 10 hour trip. Um and so it was like, it was, it, you said it's in Florida, which I didn't know that. I didn't know it was supposed to be in Florida. I thought middle America is definitely the vibe it gives me. Um, but then they also have Southern accents. So it's like, you're in the wrong part of Florida to begin with. Like you're in the Southern part of Florida uh, where shit like this actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Creeper is just the, you know, true identity of the elusive Florida man. Oh. Definitely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the wispy hair in the back. Yeah. I don't I never got that but I love it because yeah if you saw this dude waiting in the DMV for his vanity plate um you wouldn't I mean you know maybe if you're in the Florida it's a com, you know commonality but like I love like it's expanding on the like hypothetical mythology here because if he has a vanity plate he had to get it from the DMV which means he has a driver's license which means he registered in Florida he has you know he got his picture taken he he took his driver's test all of this happened yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, this guy has, uh, he's a Florida boy with a W, uh, you know, and kind of, I imagine him in his, in his beating you truck, I was in a Kodak Black or something of the sorts. Um, yeah, in the wrong part of Florida, for sure. He's definitely not in Miami. Uh, <laughs> we'll definitely say that. <laughs> oh, so they, uh, they're driving, they're talking. I love how the truck just comes out of fucking nowhere. You're not even paying attention to it. You're paying attention to them. And then this truck just shows up. There's so many shots like that in this movie, like where you're not supposed to be paying attention is where the shit starts going down. And like, it drags your attention there. That that's cool. Yeah. I was going to applaud. Like one of the things I took a note of was like the cinematography. There's this really good scene and it's uh, Gina uh, Trish that she's waiting for a dairy to come back up from the church. Uh, and uh, she's there, you know, kind of twiddling her thumbs, looking around in the background. You see the headlights during the day. So why not? Um, but it works. It works so well. And you're like, the suspense is there. And there's like certain shots in this movie that like, yeah, this is like, oh, this is really thoughtful. Uh, and kind of goes out of its way. They're like beyond just like the typical horror movie shot. Um, but that's such an iconic scene. If you see like the truck lights in the back and it's just like, oh, like, bitch, hurry up and get in the car, start your old beater. Um, because yeah, you, of course, you know, it's never going to start on time. And then what happens? It's just some passerby truck on this lone highway. 
Um, but that is such a good scene. I'm glad that you brought that up. I'm looking up the cinematographer now. His name's Don E. Fauntleroy. It's a hell of a name. Um, some of his other work as cinematographer includes um, Jeep. Wow. Really like nothing of note except for the Jeepers Creepers films. Everything else is like crazy obscure films I've never heard of. Uh, Anaconda three and four. There's something. <laughs> and then, but he, uh, he worked in the camera and electrical department for Terminator two and the Goonies. So he came up with some heavy shit. Uh, yeah, cool. I like looking at the resume of these guys. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you're right. The shots in this movie are impressive, especially the random, you know, blurred out crazy, like when the creeper takes out the cops and the camera focuses on the brother and sister while he's on top of the fucking cop car back there. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, there's a scene where she looks up and they're at the diner and she's looking up and it's like, yeah, like this is like where she hits like that shift to like that next act, like shit gets real. Um, yeah, it's a, definitely a sleeper. I appreciate, uh, you know, I don't know if this was meant to be more than just like a 2000s movie sort of throwaway. Uh, but I would say that, yeah, like this, I feel like they put it in more intention uh, than maybe people who are just casual fans of the movie would give them credit for. Yeah. I bet there's some moments in this film that are haunting. Like, you know, when uh, Derry goes into the tunnel and suddenly realizes the walls are paved with bodies, hundreds of bodies that are like preserved. And I love when he finds the couple they were talking about with the urban legend at the high school. It's like, holy shit. And his lo the look on his face is just absolute terror when he sees that class ring. <laughs> Yeah, when Justin Long gets in the car uh, back from the whole scene and it's the jump scare when he pops up, that still gets me every single time of that movie. Um, yeah, and like the the look on his face, like this kid is genuinely scared. He has like traumatic, like he's traumatized, you know? And then his sister is pestering him of like, you know, what's going on, what's going on? And Justin Long really sells that sort of feeling of like, yeah, I'm like, I went from, the innocence is totally lost from this kid that you meet in the beginning of the movie who brought his laundry home, you know, now he's, and he says, I'm genuinely scared. And, you know, uh, I think sort of one of the tropes that sort of the male characters in movies and horror movies fall into is like, Oh, I'm not scared of anything. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fight the villain, you know? Um, but the innocence is definitely lost in that character. Yeah. You see him where he's uh, yeah. Cause you know, you see the, the, the urban legend of their high school and he recognizes the people he gets the class ring. Um, you know, rewatching it now as an adult, uh, definitely is like, wow, this is a uh, really good acting on this part of Justin Long to sell that traumatized role. I really wish we gotten to hear what the uh, the wrapped up guy said to to Derry right before he died. I was hoping that that was going to happen, and then we never got anything on that. Yeah, and that I like that scene is burned in my head, like for sure. And you see, like him sewed up. Um, and like, it's never explored in like any of the sequels either, to my knowledge. Um, and the fact that he's like still alive is like, I wonder what part of the body he took out. <laughs> yeah, he stitched him back up. I mean, he, weird that he would do that and then just ditch the body. Like, why bother stitching him up if you're just going to ditch the corpse? Yeah, and the fact that it's called the House of Pain. Um, yeah, it's like intentional sort of creep yeah it's like so creepy uh, that it's like even called that the house of pain and just like the mural of like the dead book and he says it's like a fucked up just uh, Sistine Chapel and it's like there's no better way to do it and the, the fact that they're mum like they're mummified like the fact that the creeper is an embalming like genius that he's able to preserve these bodies in such a way uh yeah like it's so intentionally creepy that you that's where it kind of transforms with oh this may just be a serial killer uh, to like, oh no, this guy is uh, sort of supernatural. Yeah, I mean, he's been doing this for maybe ever. I mean, we don't know how old this guy is, but it's implied that he's, you know, primordial almost. Like, he's a force of nature that's just been around forever. You can't kill him, you can't beat him. Even, you know, if he goes into hibernation, he's going to remember you when he's out of that. Uh, yeah, the, the smell aspect is something that, uh, that rewatching this now was like oh i i get now like he's like, with the whole clothes in the car i don't think i kind of missed that the first couple of times watching this 
Um, but like he's going out of his way, he's sniffing your clothes. And, uh, and then towards the end of the movie where he's like his, his host, his, he's focusing so much on his smell. Um, Cause I'm assuming what I got from it the first time, I didn't really caught on to this, but towards the end of the movie, he's like actually blind. Right. Cause he's not blind the whole movie. Well, I think, you know, eventually his, his stuff wears out and he has to get new stuff. So I think at this point, his eyes are about to go. So he's just on the hunt for some new eyes. Yeah, the, the smelling and the, the tasting and it being so uh, sensory. And yeah, it's just definitely the creepy qualities of uh, you can feel that, you know, that, that energy, that creep uh, sort of breathing down your neck. Um, yeah, definitely in rewatching this, uh, I was able to appreciate that sort of that sort of terrifying aspect of the movie. A little bit more. Yeah, me too. Uh, the scene where they get to the diner, it always, like, it unnerved me. It's like, do these people know something that they don't? Because there's this vibe of, like, you know, not one of us that you see in small town America all the time. But in this case, what they're talking about, no one seems, like, concerned or unnerved. Or even the cops are kind of like, we'll handle it, but, like, not in any hurry. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of, I would say there's a little bit of inconsistency in that because then it's like you get the the, the first sort of sheriff's deputies or whatever and they show up to the scene. Uh, and then, yeah, they're really like, oh, they seem kind of like like not concerned at all. And then they still die and they're so shocked. And then at the end of their actual, at the, like the police station and those other, like if they're in the new county uh, and you see all the missing posters and you hear these stories, like they're so aware, but obviously like, you know, you like someone is definitely in on it. Like someone has to have known, or they have to know. Like, don't be driving around these parts at a certain point in time. Um, but yeah, I wish they would explore that a little bit more. Which I think they do a little bit in like the third one, but not as not as much. Well, I bet there's some element of like you know, if we feed this thing, it'll leave our town alone, that kind of thing. So I, I haven't seen th- uh, three yet. So if it does go into that, I I don't know. Um. I do love when the creeper goes after the cops the first time when he just shows up on their car, just <laughs> rips them out of their car, gr- decapitates the one cop, and then, like, you know, snacks. <laughs> yeah, they say that, like, he's a, uh, that uh, Trish is, like, crushing on the the male officer and that, you know, that he looks like a porn cop and all the, or like a, a stripper cop and all this. And then he throws the the head onto the car. Um, that is such a, like, a cool, like, yeah. He did that on purpose to like scare the shit out of these kids. And I love it. What blows my mind is that as soon as a head lands on their car, they don't immediately fuck off. They wait and watch this thing just to see what he's doing. Yeah. The whole running over him and they're like, okay, he's like, that's enough. That's enough. I said, no, like that is never enough. Uh, Please run over him more. Um, I think, yeah, Trish is a likable character in that she sort of thinks like the audience. Uh, that she's like, yeah, I'm going to hit him with my car because, yeah, fuck this. I'm sick of this. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to kill this thing. Um, but, of course, as we see later on, you know, uh, to no avail. Yeah, oh, when they get to the to the Poho County, I believe it is, police station, and they're, like, calling their parents, and that <laughs> little cop is doing the night count. And he goes and he sees that thing like devouring one of the inmates. Oh my God, I got chills. That was so free. And you see it's like weird bat tendrils hanging out of its back. And you're like, that's when you first realize, well, what the fuck is this thing? Like, Ugh. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, one of the things I noted now in this rewatch was like the transformation of the creeper from, you know, like I said in the beginning, it's like, it could be a serial killer. It could be just, you know, some random guy. Uh, and then like, he kind of starts stripping down his clothes and then at the end, like he, then he gets his wings, and then at the end he shows his face, uh, where like the the flaps of it come out. And then at the end of the movie, you're like, what the fuck did I just watch? It, it opening, you know, it's not that vibe at all. And at closing, you're just like, what the hell is this? Um, I think that's something, yeah, that they, that they do a great job in the in the film. Um, it's so unnerving, and seeing his legs, seeing his body, he's so far from human, but he has human movement and mobility. Uh, it's definitely like unnerving. What if there's some physical inspiration from Pumpkinhead? Because it there's a there's a it looks similar. I wonder if that was intentional. 
Yeah, I think I, I don't know. Like they allude to like a, a like a gargoyle sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, Pumpkinhead definitely like comes to mind of like the the claws, the color, sort of the gray, sort of cryptic monster. Um, but I don't know. I'd love to learn a little bit more. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh... It's sober freaky when it's like head opens up and it's got like spider arms in its head and it's got that guttural roar that is so inhuman. <laughs> and then Trish is trying to reason with it and this thing doesn't give a shit. It's not even listening to her. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, once they sort of learn and like uh, Derry's like, oh, are your dreams to Giselle? Like, oh, are your dreams ever wrong? Are your dreams ever wrong? And then they kind of realize that like, hey, like Derry is marked for death. And then that's when that hopelessness kicks in is, you know, and then Trish, the good older sister is like, Hey, you know, take me. And you see that sort of, you know, she's really pleading with this monster. And then, yeah, he says, fuck that. I'm going to take off. And he flies. And like, I feel like it's so like he flies in the moonlight and you see him. Um, yeah. The fact, I think the psychic element is like, this is all predetermined. Uh, you know, makes your, like it makes the scene a little bit more heartbreaking because, you know, no matter what they sort of do, you know, uh, dairy is fucked uh, to the highest degree. <laughs> I did find it interesting that the psychic goes in saying like, I don't, you know, I don't know why this is happening. I'm not always right. And then she proceeds to give a very detailed history of this thing's methodology, <laughs> which is funny. Like every 23 days, every 23 years. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. I think, uh, the timeline, like this was a, the creeper growing up was a, lot, a little bit less, scary because I was like okay every 23 years if I do the math right I should be good um and it's not springtime you know what are the chances right um no I love okay one thing that I love this guy is like has middle medieval weapons like he has a huge axe he has swords and I think in the second movie he throws a shuriken like a bone shuriken and like yeah like they're crafted like crafted weapons and uh but, you know, he's so strong, he can just rip your arms off, your head off. Uh, but the weapon aspect was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, there's so much, yeah, there's so much depth to this this monster. If you don't know how, he's going to get you. Uh, but he's going to get you. <laughs> yeah, like, the fact that no matter what you do, if he wants something from you, you can go to the ends of the earth, you can kill this thing a hundred times, you can bury him alive, you can burn him. He's going to come back, and he's going to get you. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah, don't... Don't keep your dirty laundry in your car. That's fine. <laughs> Don't not let it get your scent. Oh, yeah, that's freaky. And then what an unnerving, brutal ending. Just Derry hearing him scream and then just panning up to him with his eyes completely gouged out. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, there's something terrifying about phonographs and that sort of yeah, and, uh, 20th century technology or, you know, old time like technology, rotary phones, maybe scare the shit out of me for some reason. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like you see him like hunched over and he's in a stool and the fact that, yeah, he has a stool because why not? Um, and then he's in like the, they like end up, he's at a warehouse and he's like, you know, he's going out of his way to sew the eyes out. And even the cover of the movie, like that's one of the things that I remember as a kid the cover and it's like behind the stitch you know the stitch sort of face and you see the eyeballs and i'm like oh my god it's so terrifying and it's like visibly it's like just in long the eyes like you see him the whole movie uh yeah it's like crazy uh that scene is like yeah burned into my head for sure definitely core memory i looked into it and that was a super realistic dummy of justin long which was impressive and then to get the effect of Justin Long's eye and the creature, they just put Justin Long in the creeper makeup. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, it really sells like, oh, he's getting pieces of, uh, he's getting pieces, like everyone is a part of this, the creation of the monster. I think Giselle says a line uh, in the movie, like, oh, like if he could die, you know, he's ate too many hearts to actually do it, um, to actually die. It's like, oh, that's like so unnerving that, yeah, like he's, just constantly been recharging constantly been feeding and building this sort of this arsenal of like i guess immortality you know you could say uh even if you killed him once you know he's aided so many people he has all of the stuff stored that you know he can just live forever (laughs) 
I w- I wonder if there is like some way to to take this thing out. Like if you burn, if you kill it, you destroy it all at once. Like if you launch this fucker into the sun, that's got to do it. Oh yeah, I think it's the not to jump too far into the head, but it's like the end of the second movie, and the farmer's like there waiting, and he has them chopped into bits. He's like, "What are you waiting for?" He's like, "The twenty. It's like it's about to be twenty three years." Um, <laughs> it's sort of like the, the whole Deadpool Wolverine regeneration of like. You know, how are you going to kill these people? Um, because it's like the plot armor of regeneration and it's so overpowered. Um, yeah, there's no realistic way to to really combat this thing. Uh, which I, I liked how they go into that a little bit more in the second movie. Like, oh, we're going to take the fight to the creeper. The same thing. Like, you're not going to like, like the same as two badass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so here are three filmgasm facts. Number one. When Victor Salva arrived in Florida, he discovered that a million dollars worth of his financing had fallen through, and he was forced to cut some 20 pages of script from the end of the film. Uh, The original ending was a fiery climax where Derry managed to get behind the wheel of the creeper's truck and drive it into an oncoming train in a suicidal attempt to destroy the creature. Would have been cool, but I like the subdued, just bleak ending we did get. Yeah, the whole train out of the budget... uh... Maybe sort of, you know, saved it a little bit just because, uh, yeah, I think that sort of keeps up the the luster for any sort of sequel uh, of, you know, like now you have one victim, but obviously the story goes deeper. Um, but also, you know, with Derry's character, I think his his whole character arc is really like, yeah, you really feel you really feel for the kid. Um, just kind of a passerby with bad luck. Yeah. Ugh. Number two, at the time of its release, this is the highest grossing film to ever be released during Labor Day weekend. The record would then be broken by Jeepers Creepers 2. <laughs> so pretty cool it had that. I'm pretty sure since then that's been broken substantially, but cool to have that at the time. Um, and number three, near the beginning of the movie, you can see Trish holding a pair of reading glasses, which is probably why the Creeper prefers Derry, because he doesn't want broken eyes yeah i always wondered like uh like does like you know like trish has astigmatism or like what's going on you know like he's able to see yeah this chick's gonna get glaucoma it's not a good investment let me get uh yeah dairy's 2020 uh, or what appeal you know if you have a heart murmur like is he gonna like if you're just like completely have all these ailments if, are you safe basically uh well, I love that he can tell. Like it's it's like on site, he can tell. Like, is this person is this person healthy enough for me to take them? Because like, if I was this creature, you know, I wouldn't want to. I'd want to build the best me I could get. So you want the the choice cuts, so to speak. Oh no, definitely. Yeah, I'm thinking like in the scene we're talking about in the holding cell, and he's eating the guy's leg to repair his leg. I'm like, oh god, it's so creepy. Like he's gonna get you for what you what he needs. Uh, Oh, it's so it's so unnerving. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the sequels. The first sequel was 2003's Jeepers Creepers 2, which sees a basketball team's bus break down in the desert near the end of the Creepers feeding time. So it's his last day, and he's like, you know what? Let's have dessert. And he goes after this basketball team, and uh, they fight back. And it's actually it's pretty cool. Two is my favorite one that I've seen so far. Just because everyone's like, I'm not taking this shit. And they go after this fucker. <laughs> yeah, then it's like the Florida man farmer. He builds like a ballista, because why not, in the back of his pickup. And him and his, you know, his yeehaw son are going to go kick some ass. Uh, and they shoot him out of the air and like all this stuff. Like, it's so cool. Um, the bus, like the bus, the whole bus uh, kind of act is like so burned in people's mind. Uh, for me, learning about like sort of the the gross, like the how much it grossed in the box office. Uh, this is to me, this is like a not a hood classic, but like all the little like Latino kids in my school growing up, we all knew Jeepers Creepers. We've all seen it multiple times as one of the more scary sort of of our generation. You know, that's our generation's uh, Freddy Krueger, I would say, or some one of the bigger you know horror sort of monsters. Um, yeah, that whole bus scene that anytime we had a field trip uh, and like it got any sort of like towards night or we had to stop somewhere. Uh, yeah, Jeepers Creepers is going to get us. Uh, 
you know, know your exits. That's definitely a uh, core sort of fear I remember having in school. Oh, dude, I took a, I was in UIL in high school and we took a bus trip to Odessa and it was just <laughs> nothing for miles. And that's the only movie I was thinking of. I was like, ah, oh, he's out there. Fuck, we're going to die. <laughs> Yeah, definitely Odessa is the type of place for a movie like this to occur. So uh, I would, yeah, I would, I feel that so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, next up was 2017's Jeepers Creepers 3, which sees the creeper emerge from his slumber 23 years later, resume his eating spree. Uh, this one wasn't very well received, uh, considered pretty shitty. Um, I, I haven't seen it because of the stigma, but I'll watch it eventually, I'm sure. Yeah, I was looking up uh, articles associated with Jeepers Creepers, and I guess they made him maybe have missed it the first time, but I guess there's like a child sort of abuse uh, associated scene in one of the movies, maybe. I totally could have read that wrong, uh, yeah. which, to, you know, I didn't kind of catch that the first I've only seen the third one once, and it really is sort of a throwaway kind of like, yeah, the gross butt of the franchise. Um, yeah. The lighting's weird, the recording is weird. You see the creeper a little bit too long. Uh, the kind of and there's, there's a lot of stuff is during the day too. Um, it does do some world building, I will say. Um, at the end, uh, Trish does make a like a cameo, uh, which is cool. And to see her, you know, she's still. You know, you kind of feel for the sort of one franchise actor. You know, like oh, you know, they're just like the one kind of movie and the throwaway. Yeah. Uh, but definitely, sort of like. You don't have to watch it. If you have good memories of the first two, you know, it's cool. Maybe like you get a little bit more, but uh, definitely nothing sort of like the first two at all. Um, but also it was in production. I remember seeing fan made trailers of that movie for years on YouTube. It was on like, you know, development hell uh, for so long. And so it's kind of like a little bit, a little too little too late, I would say. Uh, but seeing, I think the teasers out for the fourth one, uh, which I'm sure you're going to get to. Uh, we'll see, you know. Well, you know, we've got a companion podcast to this one called Beyond the Bad, where we talk about the worst films in history. So that might be the place where we throw Jeepers Creepers 3. Because uh, I do want to talk about it, but not in the same reverence I'm going to talk about the films on this show. <laughs> no, definitely. There is some, like, some saving points. Like, if you're into just, like, the kill count sort of vibe of, uh, you know, like, what are the coolest kills in horror history? There's some cool ones. Uh, the Truck. The beating you, the beating you mobile. Um, definitely, there's more like the whole him creating shurikens and all the stuff, and the truck gets like in on the action. I will say, if you haven't seen it, um, it's really interesting because then it's like, okay, does this guy have magic or is he just like auto mechanic genius? Uh, because yeah, the truck is yeah, the truck will kill you. I feel like if I had been alive forever, I would learn to do pretty much anything. So I'm sure he, yeah, he's got no, he can do whatever he wants. I also think he talks in the third one, Ugh. but I don't know. I have to like, I'm getting like, like bad memory. I think he may talk, but there's something about a hand and old lady and yeah, definitely beyond the bad sort of material. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, maybe when the new one comes out, uh, Jeepers Creepers Reborn, which is supposed to come out later this year, does not have a firm release date yet. It's a full-blown reboot that follows a young woman who begins to have premonitions about the Creeper. Uh, Victor Salva is not involved in any way. I'm sure he's going to get some royalties because that's how it works. But um, I, I hope this, uh, this is good. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up on like Shudder or somewhere. But uh, yeah, I hope we get to see this. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, yeah, it's not Jonathan Breck for the Creeper. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, of course, like there's some sort of like, there's some actors like for or horror movies, like, you know, uh, people hated the Nightmare on Elm Street reboot because, you know, Robert England is Freddy. Uh, we'll see if Jonathan Breck is like the creeper or not. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see kind of where they go with the reboot opposed to like adding to the whole love like the trilogies kind of universe. Uh, I'm excited to see maybe if they go into a little bit more of the backstory because he's such a cool character. Um, and sort of the reboots that are coming out of, you know, movies like we had the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, the whole Halloween, you know, Halloween Kills sort of success. And then that, what they're going into with that. Um, 
so it'll be exciting to see what they do you know i think the horror uh reboot is definitely going to be kind of the the thing in the 2020s uh to kind of yeah it's a, it's a good different it's a good different sort of take than sort of the more uh really nuanced a24 sort of jordan peele horror uh so if you're more of like a this type this was the stuff you grew up on then i'm sure you maybe you can appreciate it i prefer this kind of horror i prefer honest horror i hate when a horror movie has a trailer that promises me a horror movie and then gives me a drama that's like two and a half hours long i get just pissed off immediately and then i i just have a bad mindset the entire movie uh, yeah, I think uh, it's it's become saturated with that in the last couple of years, um, and not all of them work. Like the whole, I think what is it, the Antebellum one, and it's like a horror movie. Like, yeah, that's just, just in bad taste. Um, no. Yeah, I it'll, it'll be exciting to see kind of what they do with this, and then just like with a property that's kind of been abused, you kind of always have hopes that you know they're going to turn it around. Um, well, I'm sure, you know, calling it Jeepers Creepers Reborn is like their way of telling us like it's a rebirth. It's new. It's, you know, it's not, it doesn't have that baggage with it anymore. So come check it out. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this, yeah, I give Jeepers Creepers an eight. It's a fast paced, effective horror film that introduced a brand new monster to the horror community. Still holds up. Definitely agree. Yeah, it's definitely up there for me. I would say about an eight, eight and a half. The first half of the movie, if you've never seen it for some reason, um, the first half of the movie is like one of the best of the like of the time of like the 2000s sort of horror movies to come out. Yeah. It's one of the best opening halves, I would say. Um, it does take a little bit of a tail end sort of spiral, uh, but the first two are definitely uh, kind of staples of that 2000s kind of horror time period, I would say. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Definitely, uh, yeah, core uh core memory for me definitely one of my favorites so thank you connor for letting me talk about it. i said that uh, this is one of my favorite movies and that's how we kind of got this ball rolling but yeah i will i can argue that the creeper is arguably one of the most cool slash unnerving uh horror villains that should be up there i will put myself out there and say that he should be up there in discussions of the freddies and the jasons and the other faces uh because yeah he's badass and he will kill you in multiple ways. You know? He's human. He's not human. He's a bat. Uh, he's everything. So he's Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He's the spirit of Florida. Come to kill. I, I'll, I'll buy that. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. If you like the show, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Filmgasm Productions. If you want to suggest films for us to check out or send us any feedback, you can always hit us up on the socials or email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to support the show, on Anchor, you can click on support this podcast on your preferred podcast provider. All donations are appreciated. Check out the website for reviews, articles, trailers of upcoming films, and every episode of all four of our shows. I'd very much like to thank Christian for guest hosting this episode with me. Thanks, man. Anytime. <laughs> Next week, in honor of the impending release of Ty West's new horror film, X, we thought it would be fun to discuss one of West's other films. The one we landed on is 2013's The Sacrament a religious found footage horror film that is heavily inspired by cult leader Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre of 1978. Beyond that, I haven't looked into the plot. Um, I haven't seen it yet, and I want to be surprised. Uh, But this one's been on my radar for quite some time. Figured it was time. So next week, check out the show to hear us discuss The Sacrament. Uh, Have you seen The Sacrament? I have not, uh, but you said Jim Jones, and so uh, very interested. I, yeah, I was, yeah. I'm definitely down with the cult leader sort of movies inspired. I, I love the real world sort of inspiration. So uh, may check it out. Yeah, for sure. Don't miss Cruel Jaws on Fridays Beyond the Bad, Pixar's Coco on Oscar Sunday, and a twofer on Netflix's The Adam Project and Disney Plus's Turning Red on Monday sneak preview. Until then, try not to anger any ancient man-eating demons and keep watching movies. Mm-hmm.